Hi guys, welcome to this week's masterclass. Today we're gonna take apart a song for Bilbao as soloed over by Pat Metheny, as you probably already know. Um, as I said when I released the transcription, this is one of my favorite solos ever. So it's lots of fun to take this one apart. And at the end of this little masterclass lecture, whatever you want to call it, I have a small exercise I want to share with you guys, which I think is cool and which I think may be helpful for you. All right, let's jump in. Okay, so we're starting off just great already. Uh, the chord is a C7 sus4 and every all, everybody's always talking about avoid notes and yada 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 which they have a point but it's throwing out the baby with the bath, bath water or whatever the saying is so the 11 on a major chord is actually a very nice melodic device which rhymes to have this so you are allowed to use other notes than chord tones um, during the whole solo his concept is sort of um, switching between C major pentatonic roughly speaking and C minor pentatonic. So the C minor pentatonic fits perfectly over G flat major 7 sharp 11. So the fact that there's a lot of uh, common tones between the two tonalities makes it very effective. So when you can carry over notes and adjust the other ones by half a step or something, that's melodically it's very pleasing. So then we go on and here he uses actually a B flat major over C. Let's have a, a listen. So yeah, he starts off with this B flat sound, B flat major or G minor pentatonic, I would say B flat major, which he then here um, transitions over into a, he's kind of flirting with C minor blues. And then he throws in this And this only works because of the voicing I'm using for the C. So in my left hand I have G, C, E, so C major in second inversion. And at the top I just have F, B flat, D. And if I were to use a first inversion in my left hand, it's a lot less pleasing because you have this, it sounds much harder, much harsher. Here we have the second lying next to each other, but that doesn't bother us. So voicings matter. Anyway, that's a little bit beside the point. I uh, just thought that was worth mentioning. And then we come to the bridge, which I have written in 3-4, which makes most sense to me. You could see it as a two over three, but then it would be three bars long. So having four bars of three, four made more sense to me. And these changes in the bridge are not easy to solo over. And he makes it sound very natural. Of course, here you you can see because the they do follow each other in uh, descending fifths or ascending fourths whatever 
it's the same thing. He can string like this scale upwards very nicely. He can string these things together very nicely. Um, and then here he just goes into arpeggios, triads, and we're back on C. <laughs> This is really just a master class in melodic soloing. It's just such a great solo. Let's hear that again. I mean, how perfect can you make a melody? If you really want to deconstruct this and why it works, it's basically he starts at the top of uh, the scale, in this case being the B flat, so it's a flat seven, and he just descends scale-wise. He has a particular rhythmic pattern with the repeated notes but I think a lot of it also just has to do with the rhythm even if I'm not singing pitches, this the line itself just makes sense and sounds complete and sounds like a sentence. And so rhythm is really important. You can break it down in a, in a couple of different ways, but you really feel like there's a bow in the sentence. That's one part and then Da, 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 da. That's like call and answer. These are the things that that I was talking about in the previous uh, lecture, like sentences, periods. That these are the kind of things that, if you want to practice that, there's like formulas for practicing this stuff. And melodically, it's just flat seven descending to the third. And then the third just goes, well, up to the fifth. Again, we have this uh, 11 going to the third, staying on the nine. So keeping the tension in, we're not resolving yet. If you really want to analyze it like this, you could see it as a G7 resolving to the one. Then we're back to C minor. Then we have Another brilliant little piece. Seriously. So we just have a sequence here. Uh, diatonic triads or fourth, well, actually four, four chords. So G minor seven, F major seven, and then um, E half diminished, and then here this part that's that's just that's just bebop. Pure bebop. So this is just a nine descending chromatically to the flat seven. And then here he anticipates the G flat major. Uh, this is A flat major triad going to like a D flat. So it's a more upper, upper structure based. This I would, oh, I see this. Yeah, this is just G flat major with the, with the major seven. And of course the F can stay over the C7 sus. 
which which then resolves to the third and then again triads all triads 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 nothing but triads not one passing tone or whatever some chromatic from going from the 9 to the 11 11 going to the third root again this um, B flat major sound chromatic passing notes and then the B flat resolving into a C C major sound with the first chromatically altered notes but that's just a pattern a very very white widely spread used pat matini pattern this uh, descending major third and then he placed this this should have been a an a flat by the way but whatever again b flats b flat lydian sound Mm. chromatically to the B flat here which is third not much to say here other than that it's very effective to have this repeated note then a bluesy or minor seven sound statement here we get to the bluesy part and then again this little switcheroo thingy between minor and major another thing that's very effective is that he's going up an octave here probably with a switch of something on his guitar but let's let's listen further so he's going to develop this little repeated G thing awesome um, so he develops this repeating high G theme and then here we get this chromatic very very chromatically denser uh, line which is I don't know if you recall but I mentioned this I think in the previous master class that contrast is a very effective tool in soloing and this is this is really a prime example of employing contrast so he creates this bass line actually by playing very melodically and very stepwise so more scalar ish so when he does play these chromatically altered lines or whatever or if he just injects these things it really pops out color wise and let's go a little bit further yeah so here bridge all triads again uh, spread triads Again, a little bit of chromaticism between the nine going to the major to the major third, and from the major third chromatically down to the root, chromatically from thirteen to five, B flat, C, C seven, bluesy, and then we get to this part, and here all of a sudden he starts playing fourths. This is the first time we're hearing this fourth sound. So up until now, it's been 
pentatonics, triads, scalar playing, and now we have these fourths, which is a new color yet again. And this is very effective. And these things should have been flat, so A flat, D flat, G flat. But Sibelius um, puts in certain notes as sharps by default, so I have to go in and do it manually, but they sometimes slip through the cracks. And then here, again, contrast. This is the first line which has this uh, higher tempo, this, this 16 note line, and which is very chromatic. This is the first time that we hear this and it gives just this, this punch in your face like bam. And these are the kind of things that make an, a solo interesting to hear and engaging as a listener. Because we're given a structure, we're given like a narrative and then something happens and it's, it's the same if, if you're watching a movie or whatever or following a story or you get presented with this scenery which is described or whatever and... So that's baseline and all of a sudden something changes and there's conflict and these are the things that move the story forward. So it's no different in music. I can't say I can really make sense of this line. Sort of like enclosure of thirds chromatically down to the nine. And then this thing, it's always a challenge or I find it a challenge to I think it's easy to read into things and think like, oh my God, this is such a brilliant line when, when, and with this complex harmonic thinking and maybe it's just a more finger based pattern or whatever, or, you know, I think it's just like, you could take this little group, which also has to be a flat and play it one step, a half a step lower and you'd be in the key. So it's, I think it's more like a planing thing. So he's playing half a step up outside and then he pops back inside here. And then we have this more um, C minor six kind of sound, really this Dorian thing. Again, this, this finger pattern, in this case, minor thirds going down and then resolving into this sort of A minor pentatonic and then a, another sequence which is all within the scale just this thing is a little neighbor note, chromatic neighbor note which he pops in and out of and then he just shifts it up Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So, pattern, shifting, pattern, shifting, pattern, C major, again, F going to E, minor pentatonic, um, just all within the scale, going back to C, and then again, this, this is the first time we're hearing um, double stops or more chordal playing. So when they do come along, it's really like a breath of fresh air. And this really sounds so cool. Like this is sort of a flat set, flat six, flat seven, one, which is a very majestic chord progression. And he plays it descending actually. And I think subconsciously or whatever, you're picking up on this counterpoint 
like ascending bass line, descending melody line. And it's just, it works so cool. And to finish off, just winding things a little bit down, nothing too crazy, just back to how we started. Pentatonics and very melodic, switching between major and minor, and then just finishing off on C. This is just, I think it's just it's such a cool solo. And it's just by doing these kinds of things over and over with different kinds of solos and different artists that you really, you, you really learn a lot this way. You can't learn this from a book or whatever. You really just have to check it out, study it from up close, get familiar with the sound and then just go through it with a fine tooth comb, as they say. So I'm hoping by doing this, and we're hoping by doing this, that we can give you as much value out of these transcriptions as we possibly can, so we can really help you guys. As I said in the beginning, I have, I think, a cool exercise for you, which doesn't really have to do anything with this, maybe a little, but not really. And I'll show you the exercise. Here we go. As the title suggests, it's a triad study and I've chosen F sharp major because everything always gets done in C and F major, F sharp major is, it could have been anything else, but it's like, I know F, my F sharp knowledge on my guitar could be better because I don't use it that much. So I went for the thing that I use least and try to build that up. But the concept is pretty simple. And this is this is really guitar based. So sorry, sorry for the other instruments. Um, but I'm pretty big on knowing your instrument because I know how, how what it what what a difference it makes if you're struggling to find notes and just knowing where notes are. And I've had to work really hard on that, and I'm still working hard at it. Not as much the last couple of months but i'm getting back into it and so i came up with this exercise which is pretty simple in concept and the idea is that you just start from the lowest possible option as a triad to play and you basically we're going to limit ourselves to three string sets and we're going to systematically transfer over the top notes to the next string. This A sharp gets transferred over on the sixth string and then well, we get into a new position. So we're going from root position to first inversion. F sharp gets tra transferred over to the next string and the C sharp gets transferred over. Then we're in the second inversion. A sharp gets transferred F sharp gets transferred and we're back in root position and so on. Really from the start of your neck all the way up to the top and then just back down and we're going to do this for every string set. And that way we're going to get every position, every option and we're linking them together. So we're not practicing it in isolation in one position, but we're practicing the neck as a whole, which is something I think is maybe an overlooked part of learning the neck. I think a lot of material is uh, very position based, which is valuable, but it's only part of the equation. So I, I think it's really important to really connect everything together on your neck and play more horizontally and not just vertically in boxes. So I'll show you the exercise as well. And again, this is really to just to get to know your neck better. And the better you know your neck, the more freedom you'll have, the better you'll be able, able to improvise and the more mental energy that will be freed up to do some creative stuff. So yeah, that is ultimately the goal.
so I hope you guys found this week's uh, masterclass interesting. I hope you found it helpful. As always, questions, remarks, anything, let me know. And I will see you next time.